Hi, give us a wave, everyone. Are you with me? Fantastic. If you could bring those conversations to a close, that would be great. I thought I'd just take a moment to introduce myself because, as Sarah was saying, it's amazing how many new faces are around at City Church at the moment. Uh, my name is James. I'm the lead pastor here, part of the leadership team here. I'm married to Sarah, who you've already met. Uh, there we've got a picture of us with our three boys, Noah, Seth and Jude, pulling a typically Jude face on that photo there. We, we are in the middle of a birthday season in our house. Everyone in our family has their birthday in like a two-month window. So between that and Christmas, it is exhausting and we need to take out a second mortgage at the end of it all. We've, we've just had our youngest Jude's fifth birthday. And uh, yeah, yeah, if he was here, he would have loved that, getting the woot there. Um, we, were, we were quite apprehensive about it because Jude didn't have the most positive reaction to his Christmas gifts. Um, upon opening several of them, he burst into tears and said, it's like people don't even know me. That was his line. <laughs> Apparently... There wasn't enough of a Transformers focus to the gifts, so we tried to rectify that for his birthday. We got him a lot of Transformers things, and it all went well. He, went, he loved his gift, so that was good. Uh, appeasing our ungrateful children, eh? I blame the parents. But anyway, it is, it's wonderful to be together with you all this morning. Yeah, whether this is, you know, your first time here at City Church, I met some people this morning, it's their first time, it's great to have you here, or whether you are a regular and long-standing part of the church family, do come and say hello at the end. And today, as Sarah shared, I really want to share with you a little bit about what I believe God wants to speak to us as a church as we head into a new year together. If you've been around at City Church for a while, you'll know that we believe that the whole of the Bible is God's word, it's God's living word to us, and we seek to build the whole life of our church and our lives as individuals on the foundation of his word, on its authority and on its wisdom. But you'll also know that over the last few years in particular, there's been a handful of passages from the Bible that I felt particularly kind of alive and relevant to us in a fresh way. And one of those passages is a passage I want to revisit this morning. And if you're looking for a kind of title for today's message, it's this. A people prepared, getting ready for the presence of God. A people prepared, getting ready for the presence of God. I believe that God wants to make his presence his glory, his love, his power known more deeply to each one of us and to us as a community in a greater way in 2023. And if you have a Bible with you, you might want to turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14. 2 Chronicles 7 verse 14, words that God spoke over his people in the Old Testament, but words that are still alive and relevant for us today. This is what God is saying to us. Maybe we could read this together from the screen. Let's read this. 2 Chronicles 7 verse 14. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. I want you to hold this verse in your minds. We're going to come back to it, but I just want to spend a few minutes before we get into that and what the application of this might be for us, just diving into kind of the surrounding context and the chapters that build up to this verse, this moment when God spoke these words. You know, in the Old Testament, God chose a people, the people of Israel. He started with one couple, Abraham and Sarah, and from them came this great nation who were God's chosen people. But they weren't chosen in some kind of exclusive, prejudice, keep it to yourself kind of way. They were chosen ultimately that they would in turn be a blessing to the whole world. God said, I'm going to choose you in particular and bless you, yes, but in order that you might bless every nation, every people on the earth. 
That's how God seems to love to work. You know, if you're here today as somebody who would say, I've been blessed by God, I've been saved by God, I've been chosen by God, that is never in order that you might just know and enjoy and experience that blessing for yourself. It is always so you would in turn take that to the world around you and bring God's blessing to them too. If we fast forward from Abraham and Sarah over a thousand years to to where we're at with the verse we just read in the book of 2 Chronicles, now the people of God have grown from this one couple into a great nation. They have their own land, they've conquered all their enemies, and their king, Solomon, is called by God to build a temple, an ornate, beautiful, sacred space where God is going to be present in a unique and special way. Of course, God is everywhere. Solomon knows that. But in the Old Testament, God decides to make himself present in this particular and distinct way in the temple. And the early chapters of the book of 2 Chronicles are about kind of these very detailed building instructions for this temple. And most people find that stuff a bit boring. I don't know if it's because I used to be an an engineer or just because I'm a bit of a nerd, but I love all that stuff. The chapters about, you know, this has to be this many cubits wide and use this gold here and use these curtains here and I want this craftsman to do this and this craftsman to do that. I love all that stuff. And if you read in chapters three and four of two Chronicles, you've got, it's full of detail and extravagance about the pillars and the gold and the precise size of things and, and the cherubim over the Ark of the Covenant and the curtains and the altars, right down to the nails they've got to use in the building of this temple. They spend about seven years building this beautiful, ornate temple. And after they've built it, they pray and dedicate the temple and themselves to God. And then we read that something incredible happens. It actually happens twice, both when they finish building the temple and after they've prayed and dedicated the temple and themselves to God. We read that God's glory, God's presence falls upon them like a thick Cloud. This is what it says in 2 Chronicles 5, this verse 13 and 14. Then the temple of the Lord was filled with the cloud and the priests could not perform their service because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the temple of God. Isn't this what we long for? For the glory of God, the presence of God to dwell in us. For his power, his love, his majesty to fill our lives, to fill our church, to flow out from us, to change the world around us. I want to experience more of the presence of God. I want City Church to be a place where the presence and glory of God resides and from which the presence and glory of God flows out to transform lives and communities. Do you want that? I want City Church to be a place of fervent prayer that leads to miraculous breakthrough. I want City Church to be a place of deep community and discipleship that leads us all to becoming more like Jesus. I want City Church to be a place where the praises of God are lifted up and the word of God is proclaimed boldly. I want City Church to be a light on a hill shining and declaring the love of Jesus to the city and the world around us. I want City Church to be a place and a people full and overflowing with God's glory and God's presence. You know, ultimately, that's what we have to offer the world, isn't it? We're not first and foremost just about putting on services or putting on events or having a great time. It's the presence and glory of God that we have to offer the world or we have nothing. And you know what the good news is? That this is what God wants as well. Because if we fast forward from Solomon's temple and we fast forward to the New Testament and to the church, you know what we discover? That we are now the temple of God. That God's presence and glory and mission is no longer about a physical ornate building. It's about his people. It's about me and you. The New Testament speaks about this image of a temple in three ways. It speaks of Jesus as being the new temple because it's through Jesus that the presence of God is ultimately made known and made available to us. And it's in Jesus that the ultimate sacrifice for sin has been made, replacing the need for the sacrifices in the old temple. 
It speaks of us individually as being like temples of the Holy Spirit, dwelling places in which God lives by his spirit. You know, you don't need a special building or a special priest or a special process to mediate between you and God. He dwells in you by his spirit. But the third way the New Testament speaks of the temple is that we together, as the church, as the people of God, as the people who've been saved and set free by Jesus, we are the temple of God. Ephesians 3 says this, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Do you get the significance of who we are as God's people? Do you get the significance of the church? We are together the dwelling place in which God lives by his spirit. Of course, in the same way, Solomon knew and recognized God's everywhere. He's not boxed in by us, just as he wasn't boxed in by a temple. But in a special and unique way, the church, us together, me and you, we are the dwelling place of God. And we are, as a people, the people who are going to carry his presence and his glory out into the earth to touch and bless and change lives. We're not a social club for people with broadly similar beliefs. We're not just a charitable enterprise trying to do our bit amongst many others. We're not a building. We're not a program of services and events and initiatives. We are the dwelling place of God. And so whenever we serve, whenever we give, whenever we gather, whenever we scatter, whenever we go to our workplaces, whenever we do things to bless the city, whenever we invite people in, We are building the dwelling place of God and we are carrying the glory of God. And at the start of this year, God is asking us whether you and me, do we want to see and know more of God's presence amongst us and flowing out from us to the world around us? Do you want to see more of the presence and glory of God? Lives transformed. People discipled, sinners saved, powerful encounters. That's what Solomon wanted. That's why he built the temple. And after he built it and the celebrations were finished, God appears to him in a dream. And that's where we come back to our verse from the beginning, 2 Chronicles 7 verse 14. This is what God said to Solomon in a dream after the temple was built, after it had been dedicated, after the glory of God had come. This is what God said, if my people who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. And this is what I want to focus on this morning. You know, it's really important um, to talk about all the great plans we've got as a church and we'll touch on some of those later and all the great uh, things we want to get people involved in. But actually, it starts with the heart. Getting ready for the presence of God starts with us dedicating and consecrating ourselves to God in a fresh way. If we're going to know more of his glory for both ourselves and for the world around us, because notice this is about the healing of the land, God wants to draw us back to four simple things from this verse we can devote ourselves to if we want to see and know his presence and his glory come. Firstly, we must humble ourselves. There's no presence of God without acknowledging him as Lord. You know, humble here doesn't mean just being polite and nice and kind, although that's a great thing to do. Of course, humble is much stronger than that. It means putting ourselves under God's authority. Is Jesus Lord of your life today? Is every aspect of your life surrendered to him? Or are there some areas where something or someone else is Lord? You know, everyone, whether you would consider yourself religious or spiritual or not here today, everyone has something or someone that is Lord over their life. 
the thing that drives and controls and shapes and defines everything else. It might be Jesus. It might be a relationship. It might be family. It might be money. It might be pornography. It might be success. Your Lord might be yourself. You know, we live in a culture which celebrates self being Lord, don't we? Be true to yourself, express yourself, discover who you truly are. That's the key to happiness and fulfillment. Can I suggest to you that having yourself as Lord might be the worst option of all? It's a lie that it's a good way to live, to put yourself on the throne. It leads to misery and emptiness. Today is a day to submit our whole lives to the Lordship of Jesus once more. There will be no glorious presence of God amongst us and flowing out to the world around us. No greater impact for him if it doesn't start with a greater submission to the Lordship of Jesus. We humble ourselves. Secondly, we pray. We need to be people of prayer. We need to work hard, don't we? Because it is hard to intentionally carve out time for prayer. Because prayer is the place in which we build a relationship with God and in which we say breakthrough. The founder of Methodism, John Wesley, famously, and I think a bit provocatively said, God does nothing except in response to believing prayer. God does nothing except in response to believing prayer. What might it look like for you to be a person of prayer this this year? For me, it looks like I take 10 minutes at the start of each day and I pray through the Lord's Prayer, using it as a template for my own prayers. And that's such a wonderful thing to do. It takes me through connecting with God as my Father, remembering I'm loved by Him as I pray our Father in heaven. It takes me through worship and humbling myself before Him and acknowledging His holiness and majesty as I pray, hallowed be by Your name. It takes me through praying for His kingdom to come in situations both close and far as we did this morning for Iran as I pray, Your kingdom come, Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It takes me through asking for those daily things that I feel I need or that I'm worried about. Give us this day our daily bread. It takes me through confession of sin and forgiving others as well. As I pray, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And finally, it takes me through asking for God's guidance and protection and his deliverance, which I know I need every day as I pray, lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For me, it looks like joining our morning times of prayer as a church on Zoom two or three times a week at 8 a.m. You'll find all the details if you want to do that on our church website. For us as a family, we've started using the Lectio for Families app together each weekday morning, which is it's, it's chaos and madness, but it's a wonderful thing to do together as a family. What might stepping into prayer look like for you this year? Knowing more of the presence of God filling our lives and our church and overflowing to the world around us is going to depend on us being a people of prayer. We humble ourselves, we pray. Third thing, we seek God's face. You know, seeking God's face is about desiring and seeking and being hungry for more of God's presence. Are you hungry for more of God? You know, I have no interest in going through the motions of the Christian life and of church. I want to know his presence. I want to see his glory. Because apart from his presence, we have nothing to offer the world. Moses cried out to God, if your presence doesn't go with us, don't send us, God. That needs to be our heart this year. God wants us to know and enjoy and experience him. He wants us to know his love. He wants us to know his kindness. He wants us to know his power. Following Jesus is about the head. It's about believing the right things, but it's also about the heart, experiencing God at work in us. I'm not satisfied with what I've seen and known so far. I want to know his presence more as I gather together with you I want to know his presence more in my daily life. God's presence is about those wonderful mountaintop worship experiences, but it's also about the Monday morning, knowing his presence. It's a whole life lived in awareness of God's presence. And if you want to know more of God's presence, God is saying to us today, seek my face. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. Let's be a people who seek God's face this year. And I just want to give you a heads up. 
On the evening of Sunday, the 12th of February, we're going to have a night together of worship and prayer and seeking God's face together. We're trying to do one of these each term at the moment with the hope it might become a more regular thing. We'd love to see you there Sunday, the 12th of February. Because the people who seek God's face together are a people who will know his presence more deeply. We humble ourselves, we pray, we seek God's face, and finally, we turn from wickedness. God's looking for a people who are committed to walking in his ways. God is looking for a people who are committed to repenting and turning away from sin and wickedness. God's looking for a people who are willing to be different and set apart from the world around them. A people who deal with stuff in their lives they know is not in line with God's heart through confession and repentance. A people prepared. You know, so often as we look back on great moves of God throughout history, they begin with people being overwhelmed by the holiness of God and a conviction of sin and a need to repent and come back to God. Jesus came saying the kingdom of God is near. Therefore repent. Get ready. Get your heart ready. Turn from anger. Turn from bitterness. Turn from unforgiveness. Turn from sexual sin. Turn from selfishness. Turn from gossip. Turn from a lack of compassion for others. Turn from drunkenness. Turn from putting other things before me from anything you know is not in line with my holiness. You know, God's not looking for per perfection. God knows we all make mistakes and praise God because Jesus has died in our place. Our relationship with God doesn't depend on our perfection. But he is looking for a people who are serious about holiness. A people who turn from wickedness. And if we want to see a greater measure of his presence and his glory in our lives as individuals, in our lives together as a church, we must be a people who turn from wickedness. You know, for me, in his grace, God's made me aware of areas in my own life where I need to turn from wickedness. I'm bringing before God today the way I can be impatient and angry at my own kids I don't know if anyone else can resonate with this. I never thought I was an angry person until I had children. <laughs> but I found myself, you know, raising my voice and getting angry and kind of wanting them to know I'm angry. <laughs> I'm bringing that before God today. I'm bringing before God today that I can lack compassion for people. I can lack compassion for people who are lost and broken and I'm asking him to change my heart. I'm bringing before him today that I can be judgmental of other people. You know, so often when we mess up, we, we put it down in ourselves as a, as a mistake, don't we? When someone else messes up, it's kind of defining of their character and who they are. I'm bringing that before God today. This is a moment for us, whether it's a big thing for you or a small thing for you, to turn from wickedness because it's when we do that that God's presence and glory comes in us and flowing out from us to the world around us. I'm really excited for the year ahead at City Church. You know, we've got loads of exciting things planned and prepared. We're going to be putting plans in place to launch a cap debt center to serve those in poverty, both financially and with the love of Jesus. We're going to be investing more in this amazing space God's blessed us with. We're thinking a lot about whether we need to multiply our, our Sunday gatherings to accommodate some of the growth we're seeing. We're launching our incredible uh, discipleship triplets program in a few weeks, which is going to help us all go deeper in faith and disciple one another. We've got a holiday club coming up at Easter. And that's not to mention all the ways we're going to continue to bless people through our uh, city kids and youth and student ministries and our city groups and city refugee welcome and our food pantry and other partnerships. It's all amazing stuff. It's going to be a great year at City Church. But if it doesn't start here with us humbling ourselves and with prayer and with seeking his face and with turning from wickedness, it's not going to amount to much. There will be no presence and glory of God unless we do this. And if you're here this morning as someone who doesn't know if you've ever made that decisive step of saying, yes, I want to know you, God. I want to know your presence in my life. I believe in you. 
The good news for you is that in Jesus, God himself came and died upon a cross and rose again in order that your sin, everything that holds you back from knowing the abundant eternal life he has for you could be dealt with. And you know, the doorway into that life he has for you is everything we've talked about this morning. It's humbling yourself and saying, Jesus, I want you to be Lord of my life. It's praying, perhaps a simple prayer with someone else of just accepting Jesus into your life. It's seeking God's face. It's saying, I welcome you into my life by your Holy Spirit. And it's turning from wickedness, acknowledging I've fallen short. I've fallen short, God. I need your salvation won for me by Jesus on the cross. You can do that this morning. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what kind of life you've lived, what you've done. If you come in humility and prayer and seeking his face and asking his forgiveness, you can know the goodness and life God has for you today. But God's asking and inviting all of us to be a people who know and carry his presence in a greater way this year. A people who together become the very dwelling place of God like never before. And it starts here with humility, with seeking his face, with prayer, and with turning from wickedness. So this is how I'd like us to respond today. In a few minutes' time, we're going to share in communion together. Myself and the rest of the senior leadership team are going to be standing along the front. Uh, perhaps if you guys could go and start to get that ready, that would be great, and set up the stations here at the front of church. And maybe the band could come back up now as well. Let's stand together as a church family. Can we stand? What I'm going to do in just a moment is I'm going to invite everyone who wants to to come forward during the next song to take bread and juice. There'll be three stations at kind of each of the aisle points, one over on this far side, one here and one here with, with juice and with bread for us to take communion together. Jesus asked us to remember him in this way, remember him, his shed blood and his broken body for us. And as we take communion, we're going to come forward as a sign that we're doing this corporately. We're acknowledging that we are the dwelling place of God. We are his temple. You'll come and you'll pick up a little cup of juice and a little piece of bread. And if you just pick that up and then head back to your seat and you can take that by yourself or you can gather with some other people around you and just sharing that with one another and pray. You might want to pray in that sense of humility and seeking God's face and turning from wickedness. If you need um, gluten-free bread, I know some people will. At this far side, you can get that. We'll have some gluten-free bread over at the far side there. But before we take communion together, I'd love us to say a prayer together, just as an act of dedicating ourselves to God in a fresh way. Um, there's a beautiful service that they have in the Methodist church every year called a covenant service in which people recommit their lives to God at the start of a new year. And I just think the words they use in this prayer are a really beautiful way for us as a people to covenant, to commit ourselves to God in that spirit of humility and that spirit of prayer, that spirit of turning from wickedness, that spirit of seeking God's face. So I'm going to read it for you first, just because I know it's not nice to say a prayer. You don't know what you're going to pray all together. And then we're going to pray it together. This is what we're going to pray in just a moment. We're going to pray, I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will. Rank me with whom you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed for you or laid aside for you. Exalted for you or brought low for you. Let me be full, let me be empty. Let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and wholeheartedly yield all things to your pleasure and disposal. And now, glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are mine and I am yours, so be it. And the covenant now made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven, amen. 
So if you feel able to do so, and if you want to commit your life afresh to God today, if you want to, with me, invite him to make his glory and presence known in us and through us in a deeper and richer way this year, whether you're doing that, you know, as a recommitment or whether you're actually going to use this moment to commit your life to Jesus for the first time, why don't we pray this prayer together? If we could go to that next slide. Let's say this together. I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will. Rank me with whom you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed for you or laid aside for you. Exalted for you or brought low for you. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and wholeheartedly yield all things to your pleasure and disposal. And now, glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are mine and I am yours. So be it. And the covenant now made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen. Amen. So as we begin to sing now, please just begin to come forward um, to the three areas along the front here. Take some juice, take some bread, gluten-free at this far side. Take it back to your seat, take it by yourself, take it with others. Worship, pray, the band are going to lead us. Let's begin to come forward and join in communion now.